Hello and welcome to Fellowship in Essential Oils. Adam here, Liz is joining me, and we've brought another friend along today, Liz. Yes, my lovely friend, Helen. Helen Nagel-Smith. Hiya, Hel. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me along. Uh, Why don't you tell absolutely. people about yourself? Um, I'm a clinical aromatherapist working in um, the UK, and uh, I've been working for about 16 years now with essential oils. So uh, I work, I have my own practice at home where I see clients, I write about essential oils and I teach about them as well. Mm. And how I discovered you, Helen, before uh, Liz introduced me to you, was you've written this amazing book about rare essential oils. What made you want to write about rare essential oils? Um, I think, Adam, it was because um, when I started out, uh, like most people, you kind of, if you start your aromatherapy training, you start with like a core number of essential oils. And they're the, you kind of, you go to's, aren't they? And some of those, obviously, you know, I'm still working with now. But as time progresses and as your knowledge expands and you hear about new oils and you hear about oils that you didn't train with initially, and it's like, well, I need to find out more about that. And particularly in Australia, you've got loads of oils that are new coming out. You know, we I think in the UK, we kind of think about Australian oils still. And we think about eucalyptus and tea tree and maybe Niaoli. And we're starting to learn about Fragonia, but we're kind of not really um, always able to expand that knowledge of different essential oils because there's so many new essential oils out there now you know we can't possibly know uh, one of my suppliers sells over 500 oils I can't possibly know about 500 oils but I enjoy that journey of learning um, about those essential oils and how I use them with my clients and myself and what comes to mind with me when I work with them and looking at the chemistry and stuff so that's really what I wanted to do I wanted to just bring in some other oils that we don't typically train with to kind of widen the conversation around those really. And one of the oils that you have in your book is one of my favourites from Australia as well. It's Kunthia and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Fabulous, fabulous oil. Can't wait. <laughs> it is. What, what, tell us about your first um, experience with it. How did, how did it come, come into your life and what, why did you fall in love with it? Well, I, I suppose I I was, so I, the full disclosure, I was teaching about this oil first. That's how it kind of came into my being, if you like, the, the school that I teach with, we were teaching about it. And um, I'd smelt it, I'd heard a little bit about it, but not much. I didn't really know what it was about. Um, and I started working with it and I really enjoyed it because I think it's very, um, I think it's got a lot of um, potential and I don't think we know enough about it. I think I think this is a bit of a star that we should be highlighting a little bit more. Um, I think it's very good in terms of, I use it with clients um, a lot for emotional protection. And I was really actually th thinking about it, the first time I really heard about Kunzi, I actually have to say, um, was, was through um, Jane, Jane Lawson, when she was talking about using it with the Grenfell fire. So we had um, a, a terrible tower block uh, fire in the UK I think yes. it was around 2017 awful awful incident lots of people were killed it was horrific mm. very badly um, managed but we won't go into the politics of it um, but one of the uh, blends that Jane was talking about was using Kunzia, Fragonia and, and Cataphrase so I was really intrigued about Kunzia then but I didn't really get to work with it too much and then later on started teaching about it but I really like it for, I like it for pain. I like it for emotional safety with clients. Um, and I found I was using it a lot in the run up to COVID. You know, when we were in those weeks where we knew we were starting to lock down and people were really starting to feel frightened, that's when it kind of really came to play for me as an oil. Yeah, wow, wow. Liz, I can see you wafting something in front of you. I assume you're wafting Kunzia. I am, I am. So that, so actually, so this is probably a tip. I never hear people say this, but I was taught this right at the beginning. If you are doing that while you're learning about the oil there and you're hearing other people talk about it, it kind of imprints the learning better um, when you like smell it. You kind of remember what people have said. Um, and I think it's the most obvious thing. But so it's lovely to hear other people talk about it and to just smell it at the same time. And yeah, do you know, I really remember those times with, uh, with the Grenfell fire and that had passed me by completely. I hadn't absorbed that information at all. 
Um, but yeah, mm. so I've been really, in, I do all use this oil um, for lots of different things. So I'm looking forward to hearing what other people have said, but interesting that uh, that Hal said emotional protection because protection is exactly what I use it for as well. I'm interested to know from the indigenous person, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> Come on, it's grown on your soil. You start us off. Okay, well, first of all, um, where it where it grows in Australia, it grows on the east coast. Um, it has these beautiful white flowers, um, and it, one of the interesting things I found is probably the most closely related other plant to it is actually kanuka, which we find over in New Zealand. They share the same Latin family as well, type of thing. Um, there, it's got a long history of indigenous use of them, crushing up the leaves um, and using it both for inhalation but also rubbing it on the body as well. And I think if we start looking maybe at the physicality of Kunzia, um, this one, from my own experience, I remember about three weeks ago now, um, I, you know, as you get into your 40s and you get a little bit wild and you hurt yourself while sleeping, because um, you sleep funny on your pillow, had just a neck that was really, really sore. And I tried different essential oils that, um, you know, the, the typical kind of go-to one um, in that case. And I'm like, I think a little voice in my head just said Kunzia. And, you know, I started massaging that in a couple of times a day and I found real great relief and it was really great for that. So from the physical, I love Kunzia for pain. Um, and here in Australia, where it is definitely building a name for itself as one of our top oils, pain is what people are often going to for it as well. Helen, what, what do you find on a physical level you're using Kunzia for, for yourself and for your clients? Um, largely, um, like you say, muscular pain. Um, so very often, um, if I want something for muscular pain, but I want something that isn't going to leave somebody feeling really um, highly stimulated or, you know, like, you know, sometimes you'd use rosemary for muscular pain, but, you know, you don't want to use that in the evening. So I might turn to something like Kunzir instead. But also I've used it interestingly as well, where there's been um, a bit of a, a, a shock factor. So like... Um, uh, sort of if you've been involved in a car accident for example and you've had whiplash mm. so you've got that kind of that spasm and that muscular kind of pain and that wrench but you've also got that <clears throat> kind of what's just happened to me feeling so I found it's useful for that I would normally always use it in a blend not always but quite often I'd use it in a blend um with other sort of pain relieving oils. Um, but for that kind of that shock factor, I think I would often use it in that sense. Um, I think also arthritis, I find it's very good with that. It's highly anti-inflammatory, isn't it? Um, and it seems to work nicely for that. And um, I remember when I was first sort of um, looking into it as an oil, and uh, remember sort of seeing that it was good for insect bites. So I thought, well, next time I get a bite, I'll go and slap it on and see if it works. And it, does, it works really well. Um, I think it works as well as um, lavender topically on an insect bite, um, for sure. So I think it's really useful from that kind of point of view as well. Again, insect bites are very um, quite aggressive and quite angry, aren't they? Um, mm. and you need something that's going to kind of soothe it and calm it down um, so yeah I tend to use it more on a physical level really I think for muscular pain and arthritis arthritic pain um, pain that's either very sudden but then has an element of shock with it like the whiplash or pain where there's that sort of that ongoing it's stopping you doing stuff you know like it's a barrier kind of pain um, which I think arthritis can be for a lot of people Think it can feel like it's a real barrier to kind of battle all the time so i find kunzi is quite nice in a blend for, for that as well um i love that i've you've i've learned something now because i know when i've you know there's times where i've injured a calf muscle and you use all the you know the pain ones there but i was using neroli as a bit of a, a you know a trauma kind of thing but yeah the fact that kunzi can help with the pain but also the trauma, it's kind of a two-in-one two, two in one punch there, which is awesome, I think. And they'd be great together, wouldn't they, if you put Neroli and Kunzia together for trauma? Very much so, yeah, as a bit of a trauma duo, them. yeah. Liz, how That's are you using quite... them on a practical level? Well, so, yeah, what well, just, you say, Liz? so I don't forget, because you know what I'm like. So <laughs> going back to what Helen said about trauma and about whiplash, that's very similar to how Robbie's ex says to use it, how like when there is a, a, a an emotional trauma, how it can actually lodge in the muscles 
and how we don't let emotions move through our body enough. And so you will then eventually have them stopping and nutting. And she talks about how it's such a body, good bodily oil because not only does it unknot the, the, the fibres of the muscles, but also moves the emotion through. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I like what you say about insect um, bites as well, because one of the things that I noticed about it, if you're looking like a doctrine of signatures and you read about what, what the plant does in its environment, it's so good for in, for pollinators because it's so rich in nectar and those uh, um, nectar rich plants are heart opening plants um, you always have those that sort of almost like a generous to the environment aspect to it so how it, it uh, allows the the movement between one species and another which i'll come back to in in a minute but also these nectar rich plants are also extremely good for insect bites and stings um, mm. So, so whenever you see these these plants that seem to be covered in insects because they they just can't get enough, like eucalyptus actually, and and, and pe peppermint and all of those things, very very good for stings. Um, and also from Doctrine's signatures point of view, uh, it's lovely to. I mean, if you if you look really close, it's such a pretty plant. Um, so it's got like needle like almost curved leaves. But then these beautiful five uh, petal, almost like as if you completely learned to draw them at school, little rounded uh, <laughs> leaves. And then the, the stamens come out really uh, far. So you have like this fluffiness of it. So when you look at it, like a, a plant that's got five um, petals, it's a bit like Leonardo da Vinci's man. So they always say that these are particularly good for human, but for limbs. Um, and then where, if you think about how the stamen is so erect, I think that we probably have to consider that that may have like a, a sexual element to it. Um, and so given that it's white flowers as well, sort of an emotional component to um, erectile dysfunction and that kind of things. Um, but also, yeah, just as Hal said, um, I, I'd probably say rheumatism more than arthritis, but I absolutely agree with what she says, how, how those kind of conditions really get in the way of you um, living your life, you know. Um, and I don't know if you remember, Hal, there was a, an, I think it was maybe two years ago, the, the Arthritis Association did a big um, drive to try and get funds and stuff. And they were talking about how sex life really um, struggles when when you've got arthritis because it's just too painful to do it so um, I think all of those things would be a tremendous way to use it so obviously when we're talking about sex we're talking about intimacy and where people are being quite vulnerable do you think tying that in with the trauma we've been talking about this could be a good one for anyone who's experienced um, you know and, and doesn't feel confident in the bedroom for something that yeah. may have happened in the past or just overall self-esteem yeah, I, I would I would definitely say that was true. And and particularly for those kind of conditions like vulvodynia, where it's it it hurts and there's like an unconscious clenching. Don't do it on purpose, but everything in your psyche goes, no, nope, you're not doing that to me. You know, those kind of situations, I think it would be really helpful. Now, we've talked before about, um, you know, oils, what they do physically that kind of moves into the higher levels. Well, we're talking about how good it is for insect bites. And then both of you, I think, have referred to it as being good for energetic protection. Let's dive into that because I know a lot of people, they feel that they need to protect themselves energetically. Um, why couldn't you? Go for it, Hal. Well, I think I think when I started working with Kunzia and really, really delving into it and writing about it, um, the the image that kind of came into my mind was almost like a protective, a big protective brother coming in and scooping up a small child. Like, it's all right, I've got you, we're sorted, you know, sort of energy to it. Um, and it's interesting because it feels kind of quite male to me, Kunzia. Um, it, it's just, that, that's just how it feels to me personally. Um, but it has got that kind of, that, that scooping up, that kind of, I'm going to look after you sort of feel to it. So I think energetically, it's kind of it, it's good that from that point of view, if you feel that you need um, something beyond yourself to help you look after yourself. And interestingly, I was thinking earlier on, because 
it's always a way, isn't it? You write about something, you talk about it, and then you go back to it and you go back to it and you see different layers each time, building and building on what you know and experience and how you use it. And I kept thinking, oh, I think this would work really well with Angelica Seed. And I put the two together and they smell really, really good together. I think they do anyway. Um, they're really kind of quite green and fresh. And, and I think they would literally charge you off like children in a playground. I think you'd have to be quite careful with them. But I think energetically it could work really nicely um, in terms of just um, raising your spirits and knowing that you'll be okay with what you've got, where you're at. Um, I don't think it's something I'd use around um, people that you describe as like an emotional vampire or anything like that. I don't think it would be the first oil I'd turn to, but I think it's got a wider protective almost like a family sort of community element to it um so that you perhaps don't feel like you're alone with something um mm. that you can help separate off and and see the bigger picture as well you know because I think energetically we often need to do that don't we we get very um into our heads and into our thoughts very easily um maybe it's just me but, <laughs> but I think a lot of people do a lot of my clients you know say that you know they're sort of you know things are whirring around in their head and sometimes you need something that allows a little bit of separation between where you're at and where other people are at as well I think particularly at the minute we live in a I don't know a world that seems very divisive where we're feeling a lot of change and a lot of ripple and undercurrent going on so I think Kunzia could be quite useful in that respect Liz <clears throat> so I disagree when you say about emotional vampires, because that's exactly what I do use it for. Oh, is it um, really? How interesting. Yeah, exactly. And so, and the reason on why... Its own, came, on its on, own, Liz, on its own, you use it for that. With, with celery seed. But, um, oh. but also, so the reason why I came upon that idea was looking as you know how i always look at the like the indigenous medicine which is not there you know it's just not there so kind of just looking and seeing if i can sort of dissect clues and it's got other names so they call it the white cloud bush mm -hmm. and the poverty bush because it doesn't have to it, it lives in nothing basically and uh the tick bush so the reason why they call it the tick bush is because when the first um white people and settlers came they noticed that there was always animals underneath the tree and that was because they were getting rid of the ticks the ticks don't like it and they climb off uh, off them when they're under it so I kind of went two ways with that I thought right okay because well so let's just put that into context if you're the kind of person that does a lot of healing and puts a lot of sort of positive energy out into the environment it's a delight for people who can't be asked to do their own work <laughs> and I don't know if about the two of you but I quite often have people who are just like hungry for my energy and it's it's lovely for them but after a while it's just like it's not fair on on the like the host for the parasite is it that you just like how much are you gonna take you know um, and I thought, right, I'm just going to try. And I, uh, there's a couple of people that I dearly love in the world. I like them very much, but I know that they've got no off switch, you know. And so I thought, next time I come into contact with you, I know, you know, I'm going to spend some time with you. I'm just going to try it. And it was heaven. It was as if they went, oh. So I always think as well, like, it's almost like Piscean energy. So like we think about how the water energies are. So I'm a Cancerian and we kind of roll with the punches in the waves, you know, we're tossing and turning and always in the emotions. Scorpio are diving for pearls that are so deep. It's too deep for tears, you know. But Pisceans, they're just like swimming. Is that your stuff? Is that my stuff? Don't know. And, and I really find that quite exhausting when we have like a piscean transit to be like i don't i don't know is, is that your stress am i i'm picking up your stress i don't know again fantastic for able to uh, to kind of protect me from everybody else's stuff i love when a group of us get together and we all talk about what our separate things are and you can kind of start to see you know different parallels one thing i just noticed is that 
Um, Helen, you said you'd like to pair it with um, Angelica seed and Liz, you said celery seed. Why do you reckon we're choosing seed there? Is that coincidence or there's no coincidences? What do you reckon? No, and, and Angelica's a really heart opening oil as well. That's like the, the, the classic doctrine of signatures uh, um, e e expression of a heart opening oil. Yeah. And, and it's really sort of up and out, isn't it? There's something about Angelica seed, not the root, but the seed is like, oh, you know. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's kind of, I, yeah, I think it's interesting that we both picked seeds that we put it with. I don't think that's a coincidence either. I think that says a lot about um, seed oils and, and the plants themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I said I went off two directions. So we said about parasites. Um, and actually, um, I've seen that there's quite a lot of evidence into how it might perform for nits and head lice. So that's interesting. But the other way, there's tickies and has another meaning, doesn't it? And I have found um, for kids who have got like, you know, the tick, uh, like with Tourette's and with um, ADHD, that kind of thing, where there is a tick, there's that calming element to it as well. Mm, mm. The other thing I noticed as you're talking, Helen, before about um, you know, it's got this almost like this protective male energy. Um, what myself and Vanessa, when we were working with it, writing our book, we kind of found that, you know, we kind of were having these images of um, women throughout history who have been repressed. We, we were thinking of like uh, Mary Magdalene, of Lilith, of uh, Medusa, how they kind of, you know, their magic or their, their power was suppressed and how as a culture and overall around the world, that feminine energy is often, or the magical or the mystical energy is repressed. And we're kind of scared to show our intuition and, and that type of thing. And we found that Kundi is a really nice one for helping to kind of unleash our magical power. Um, it almost had a bit of rebellion of like, maybe I've got my bodyguards now, it's safe for me to step out and be my true authentic magical self. Um, that really came through loud for us about Kundi. That's really lovely. I like that. It's a nice, yeah, it's a really nice image, actually, isn't it? Kind of releasing yourself into your own being properly, which I think mm. is that, sort of that, that strength, isn't it, that it has, that strength element. So a weird thing then. So I've been looking at new earrings this week and particularly ones with Medusa. <laughs> well, I've been working with How odd's that? <laughs> Uh, I think we're starting to learn on this show that whatever we decide we're going to talk about next week, we get a, a week's course or two-week course in it and things will pop up in it, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, definitely. When you move into that energy, it seems to uh, kind of rise up from the ground, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing I f find that this is a really great one to use, being white flowers, you know, white flowers often connected to that Cancerian energy or also that lunar energy. I think this is a really good one for lunar work but I tend to see it more towards the new moon of that kind of, because it has that, you know, we talked about trauma and releasing that trauma, releasing the pain, releasing the suppression, all those different things that kind of hold us back from being ourselves. And that new moon is that new beginning. And I feel Kunzi could be a really good one for, we, we always focus on the magic of the full moon and doing all those different things. But I think the new moon is a really nice time. I often say you don't need to do anything grand, but just sit down, have a cup of tea and think about, what do I want to do? And I think Kunzi could be a really nice gentle companion for going and going, well, if I got rid of the trauma, if I got rid of the pain, if I was free, if I had my bodyguard, um, and some people refer to their spiritual team as being, you know, their angels, their guides, their totems, their ancestors. If I've got my spiritual team with me, what would I be free to do? And I think Kunzi might be a really nice gentle one to help. Gent I think it does it in such a gentle, beautiful way. Um, as Helen said before, you know, it's a gentle aroma. It's not, it's not a severe one. It's not, you know, we know wintergreen is amazing for pain or birch is great for pain, but, you know, they, they smell like a men's locker room. Quinter is a bit more gentle in the way that it really helps to release everything and just go, and it, it almost just goes, you're free now. Off you go. Do as you will. And off we go kind of thing. So I think it's, yeah, really good for that kind of stepping into a new stage, whether it be a new lunar cycle or stepping into a new stage of life, whether you're coming out of a relationship or a job and just going, it's almost like the gate just gets open and Kunzi allows us, now that we're free, what are we going to do? Yeah, uh, uh, yes. And that, and also that letting go energy, that culmination, done that, time to move on, is also third quarter of the moon, isn't it? 
So, mm. so you know, you've reached the climax of right. This this crisis is you know exploded or whatever, or you know I've achieved everything that I want to achieve with that project, and now it's time to let it go. And I think yeah, again, you're absolutely right. I would go third quarter as well though. Yeah, I love the third quarter for also being a time of you know we often on the full moon we send out to the universe this is what I want deliver it to me and then we were like where's it coming from is it here yet is it here yet is it here yet (laughs) and and it's almost a bit of a a surrender and trust that it's coming and we we just act in in accordance to be in that and we also make sure we're in a vibrational state of that because you know sometimes we go bring me something new and we get all tense is it here yet is it here yet is it here yet kind of thing it's almost like that that person who keeps texting you every five minutes when you've just gone on one date and you're like settle down (laughs) <laughs> you couldn't do the really nice one to just go hey it's coming it's coming trust so it'd be beautiful around that time as well for sure i think i think if we're not careful we're gonna have lots of messages saying how do you use this one so let's address this like applications how would we use it helen um i definitely would use it in pain blends so i would use it in um a massage definitely so i would encourage people to use it in with self massage if they want to um so i would i would put a couple of drops in you know uh 10 mils 5 mils 10 mils of of carrier oil and and self massage so i think that'd be really nice um i've used it where there has been quite intense pain i've used it with things like ply um i find it works really well with that or peppermint because like you say it's kind of got this softer element to it so if you're putting it with a, an oil that feels quite aggressive and quite harsh it kind of almost softens that sort of energy I find so um I would tend to use it with um generally in, in pain blends um the most that would be my kind of go-to whereas I think if it's more sort of an emotional sense I'd go more for inhalation and I'd maybe use it either on its own or yeah I really like the idea of partnering it with neroli or something like that I used to find I didn't like it with citrus particularly so I remember I first when I first wrote about it I was like I don't like it with orange and I quite like it with orange now actually and I quite like it with grapefruit you know if you need that sort of that fresh perspective you know that we, how we've talked about using it in terms of um, sort of emotional blockages and moving on and seeing the wider picture and you know coming into yourself then I think with something like grapefruit it partners quite well so it's nice it and it smells beautiful as well together with grapefruit it's lovely in an inhaler together or um in a you know diffuse a blend that you probably just need a couple of drops of each and diffuse for 15 20 minutes I think that would be really great for just helping people feel a bit calmer about moving forwards and and feel a bit more of an appetite for doing so as well with the grapefruit maybe mm. Liz how do you tend to use it what are your practicalities about it I love that hell about the grapefruit um I you know me I love aroma pendants but yes in in massage definitely um I think it's I think it's one you could put in a bath, but only if you put it into a carrier oil first, because it's quite high in alpha pinene, isn't it? So also mm-hmm. to say alpha pinene is one of those oils that oxidizes quite quickly. So it's one that I wouldn't want to put on the skin if I've got an old bottle of oil. Um, mm-hmm. So don't use old oils of it. Um, but yeah, I think massage and inhalation are the go-tos. Actually, before I just ask you, Hel, what's, uh, Adam, Hel, what's your thoughts about contraindications with kids? Because it's quite high in um, cineol, isn't it? Yeah, I think it I has got say, the, not on kids. Yeah, it has got the one point eight cineol in it, hasn't it? So it's got that sort of that. Um, it's got some of the same sort of chemicals that we see in like Fragonia, but not so much balance there. So we've got sort of like I don't know. My sample's got like forty nine percent alpha pinene so uh, you know then we think oh respiratory stuff as well don't we but again I think with young children when there's that 1.8 cineol tend to try and avoid it you know yeah there's always better oils isn't there or if you're going to use it on the back yeah yeah I wouldn't use it around a baby or a toddler for example just because we know that using 1.8 cineol rituals around babies and toddlers it can cause breathing difficulties so I wouldn't I wouldn't use it around that sort of age group um 
But I think, yeah, like you say, yeah, if you've got an old, don't let, don't uh, have an old or oxidized oil as a general caution, really. And if you know that you're sensitive to the 1.8 senior rich oils, then, you know, maybe do a little patch test first. But I personally, I've not had with, certainly with adults, which is kind of my core group that I work with now, I've, I've not experienced any problems with it um, so far. I think it's just, again, common sense. I mean, yes, I would put it directly on an insect bite if it was a first aid instance, which I think an insect bite is, you know, um, just as I would put a drop of one drop of lavender neat on an insect bite in the same way. Um, but I wouldn't repeatedly do that over a long period of time. Obviously, that would just be, you know, on that initial day, bring the inflammation down and, and kind of move on. Um, so yeah, those those are the kind of cautions I would think about really in terms of it. And mm. plants, um, plants that are like uh, conifer rich um, components, they struggle to metabolize them through their liver. So it's almost as if like neat uh, globules are landing on their fur. So I'd watch this one in an, um, a diffuser if I'd got a cat, but I have to say, the dog came in and was just delighted by the smell, but she only lasted about a minute and a half and went out again. So just it is clearly quite pungent to animals. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's the key, isn't it? With animals, I think we always leave the door open, you know, always leave them an escape route, always let them have their own free will because, you know, it's not fair for us to go, well, I like this smell. I'm going to diffuse it. And I'm going to trap you in the room with me. And it's the same with anybody, isn't it? So you have the same thing with your, you know, members of your family or people you live with, you know, if they don't like a smell, you don't use it around them because, you know, they don't, animals instinctively know what they like and they don't like, you know, like small children, you know, the children know what they do and don't like in terms of smells. And I think animals are just the same. So yeah, I think always, you know, letting them get out of the room really and not, not using it excessively. Like you say, cats, it's more of an issue, isn't it, with cats? Um, my yeah, dog, your dogs don't have the same issue, do they? Yeah, my dog was sitting on my feet, literally asleep while I was working with it this morning. So yeah, she, uh, Ella just came in and she was like, well, you know how they kind of go. Yeah, they, they taste, taste it again, first, don't they? Don't they? And then yeah. she was like, and yeah. then you could see her eyes going and she lay down and then it was about a minute after she was like, no, no, actually, I don't want to be in here. And then she yeah. said, if you yeah. can just see the door open, it's, it's good. Yeah, yeah. And they know when to move on. They know when they've had enough. Exactly. I, th I, I think it's going to be a beautiful one diffused. And when we look at, you know, Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing and the study of that um, and why we get so um, so many health benefits from being out in nature and in the forest, um, they, Japanese scientists found that it was the phytonicides that are floating around in the air. And basically when they started naming what these phytonicides are, these compounds, they were saying alpha pinene, beta pinene, camphene, delimonene. And so, you know, any oil that's high in alpha pinene is like, you know, although this isn't really a forest kind of, um, you know, it's not a conifer, it's a bit of an Australian version of that. These are really beautiful at the end of the day. You know, at the start of the day, we're trying to pick ourselves up. That's where citruses or florals or, you know, it might be nice or if we need to get some strength of wood oil might be good. But we're, we're trying to surrender from the day um, at the end. And I think, you know, Kunti is a beautiful one. I think it's got that, that gentle strength. I think before we we're talking about it's a gentle or soft oil, I think we should be very clear that don't mistake gentle and soft for weak it's just mm. it's more of a feminine power rather than a you know that kind of yang power that we might think of you know overbearing like we were saying wintergreen or something is i think it's a beautiful one to you know let go of the day um wind down from the day and i actually really enjoy it in the diffuser at night by itself um mm. where i might use it during the day is i think we've talked a lot about energetic protection and i think there's going to be people that are either watching or listening to this that feel, oh, I want to try this one for the energetic protection. Small spritzer bottle with some pure water, you know, ideally if it's come straight from nature, if it's rainwater, stream water, seawater and that type of thing, pop, you know, nine drops of kunzi in there and spritzing it around you, um, you know, in the morning. And just if you need a bit of a touch up, spritz it over again, use that for the day and then return the rest of it to the earth at the end of the night and then make up a new one in the morning whenever you need that. You may do that every day. Or there must maybe just those particular days where you need a little bit of help, and couldn't do could be really nice there to have that. I I don't know. I I know we're going to talk a bit about colours and um sounds later on, but I get a really nice deep blue comforting colour from the mist of Kunzia. 
Yeah, and just it's just worth saying, use only a small amount of water when you do it, because obviously it's not going to disperse it at all, putting it yeah. into water. So you'd need a, like a dispersant to do that. So don't only use a small amount, but yeah, just enough to kind of make it zing around you is ideal. I like that idea. Mm, and it would be yeah. lovely, wouldn't it, with respiratory problems as well, because again, like it's a good oil for respiratory issues, isn't it? So um, something that I forgot to mention is sometimes I've used it in um, a blend on, on around the ribs and things, you know, if you've had a cough or a cold and you're struggling to sleep at night and everything's aching and you want something that's respiratory, but you want something that's kind of going to calm you down a little bit, not raise you up right at night. So actually, it's quite difficult to sleep if you've got a cough or a cold or you're snuffly. But actually, Kunzi is quite a nice partner for that, particularly if you get it around the sort of the heart centre and the chest, around the ribs and things. So actually, your spray would be lovely, Adam, as well, wouldn't it? Just as an added component to that. Mm, even, I guess, there's a linen mist or something like that. It could be quite nice as well. Yeah. And we always, we kind of get to the end of the oil, we, we always go... Is there anything we've forgotten about Kunzia that we haven't mentioned? Is it Helen, Liz, can you think of anything we haven't talked about yet? But no, I'll, remember to, I'll, with... remember, go on, I'll remember it when I'm making a cup of tea Please. afterwards, but no, go on. Oh, bless you. It was a respiratory thing. I was thinking, oh, gosh, we've talked about loads of stuff around pain and trauma and stuff. We've got about the respiratory thing. So that, yeah, for that for me was was um, something that particularly for people that don't like, you know, your typical kind of eucalyptus or, you know, because it's quite a strong smell for a lot of people. Some people find that quite difficult to manage, don't they? So I think it is nice in, in that sense to use as a, as a gentle addition or, or different different oil for respiratory issues. Yeah. Going slightly more expansive or going slightly off topic, I know um, Liz and I have spoken before a little bit about the interest in how when the pandemic, um, you know, went around the world and how Australia's experience is very different to the rest of the world. Um, and we started looking at, has it got anything to do with the Australian essential oils and the Australian energy? You know, you've worked with a few different, you know, you've mentioned Fragonia um, and, you know, we talked about pineapple myrtle a few weeks ago as well. There's all these different blessings that come from Australia. What's your take on, does Australia have a special gift physically or energetically to give to the world, do you think, Helen? Oh, gosh, yes, definitely. So um, I, I think um, most people that know me know that at the minute I'm really massively drawn to Australian oils and South American oils. And I think it's about something spiritual that's happening in the world. I think we're having a massive kickback from Mother Nature. And I think we're going into a different needing to go into a different way of being so i personally i experience this at the a lot of the australian essential oils as having a very vibrant energy um and i don't mean um i don't know quite how to express that i don't mean that and a very young energy and i don't mean that they are because you know physically a lot of these you know uh, the essential oils have been used for you know generations you look at the, the history of eucalyptus oil and it goes back generations and generations so it's not like it's only been discovered 10 years ago or anything like that but I think possibly because you're having so many new oils coming out of Australia that adds to that sort of that sense of um, energy and vibrancy that that comes with a lot of them um, so I think there is something very, I think people are desperate for oils that spiritually help them connect in some way. And I think we've we've massively, certainly in the UK, we've massively overfarmed, massively. A lot of countries have massively, massively overfarmed. We've completely depleted our soil. Um, we've kind of messed up our relationship with mother nature in lots of different parts of the world, haven't we? Um, and I just think, yeah, I think there's something very special energetically about Australian oils. I think, I mean, our our experience or certainly what I was seeing around me as our lockdowns rolled in was a huge amount of fear, a huge amount of people feeling, oh, my goodness, what, how are we going to move forward? What are we going to do? It, it literally felt like the apocalypse was coming, you know, um, and and uh, yeah, I, that was just our experience. So it was interesting to see, yeah, interesting to see using Kunzia, particularly in the first few weeks in the run up to, to lockdown. And then in the first few weeks in particular, as we were trying to kind of embrace this sense of 
fear and how do we move forwards but uh, yeah I think there's some um, you know, something very special about Australian oil is that I can't quite put my finger on it, Adam. You, you, you'll you speak more on this one than yeah, it will make more sense to you than it will to me, perhaps. But I think it's something to do with the energy and I think the sheer amount of, um, you know, new oils that are coming through from Australia says a lot about, you you know, Australia's uh, part in aromatherapy moving forward. So I think we're going to see it getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you look on a global scale, Australian oils are quite a small percentage of global sales. Uh, I, I think that will change completely in the next couple of decades. So I could be wrong, but, you know, who, who knows? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a theory I've been, you know, dabbling with. And that's why I wanted to ask, because I'm kind of gathering opinions of other people as well. Um, I, I often talk about, you know, people are familiar with Atlantis, the ancient civilization, and there's another civilization known as Lemuria, which was believed to have been in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, they're both kind of said to be advanced spiritual um, civilizations, whereas the Atlanteans were very much about priests and priestesses and being the best, and it was almost about the individual, whereas the Lemurian energy was very much about the collective. And I almost feel like you're saying there's a need spiritually for us to get back to those lessons. And even if we look, if we travel around South America, Australia, New Zealand, um, parts of Africa there's still that more community-based kind of energy and maybe I think they might be beckoning us back to you know we're greater as a group than greater as an individual uh, in that type of way so a Lemurian energy in that way um could be um and I'm yeah I I'm waiting for the oils to speak a little bit louder but bit by bit they're all yeah they do have that real joy and upliftment um about them and, and all um there seems to be a trend of a lot of them are really good for respiratory Mm. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? How that one's come out, I feel. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Mm. Liz? Oh, my my feeling is I'm quite obsessed by 1-8 Cineol lately. I have to, uh, the, more I, the more I dislike that molecule, the more I get fascinated by it. And its prevalence in so many different Australian oils is fascinating to me. Why does it keep coming up? Um, and one thing that we know about 1-8 Cineol is that it actually affects how the, um, the COVID-19, the SARS, COVID, whatever, COV-2, isn't it, um, actually um, envelopes. So it actually, if, um, let's say it properly, so 1-8 Cineol blocks the ACE2 receptor, which is what we use, what uh, allows the... Um, virus to get into the cell and move through the um, circulatory system um, and so it's an antiviral so uh, so what it means is that the, the 1-8 signal stops the covid actually proliferating through the system um, so not viricidal viricidal stops you catching something but antiviral stops it spreading through the system and the fact that there just seems to be one eighth in the oil everywhere in all the Australian oil says to mm. me it might be a, a reason why you didn't have so much of a well a catastrophic, but also without being political, you didn't have Boris either. But <laughs> <laughs> but, no um, no <laughs> yeah. but um yeah, I mean if you look at there was quite a lot of style, the, the, um trials done in Italy who also had a terrible time of it. But what they found was those who lived by the citrus groves didn't have such a bad experience because of the phytochemicals um, that, you know, the citric, uh, the citrus phytochemicals. I think probably we have to say the same about the Australian oils, that, you know, that you were biologically protected, I think. Mm, and maybe energetically as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one little thing you mentioned, Helen, that I, I know there's going to be a couple of people listening and it pricked my ears up. I could talk for hours on end about um, Australian essential oils, but South American oils, we don't really think of many oils that come from South America. Can you reel off a few of your favourites that come from that region? So um, I really like um, Copaiba. Um, I've had quite profound experiences with that in the last 18 months that I've not had with any other oil. Um, so I, I really like Copaiba. Um, I think we'll see a lot more talk about that in the next few years as well. Um, Copal Santo, Mexican frankincense, I really like that. Um, I, I think you're starting to see people talking about quite a few of those, but for me, those two in particular 
are ones that I've sort of worked with quite a lot that I uh, would now always have as part of my box moving forwards. Um, but what again, was that second uh, one, sorry? Uh, Copal Santo. Is that sometimes called Brubranco or am I thinking of a different No, that's one? a separate one, which has also ah. been talked about quite a lot as well. But I think there may possibly be some issues with sustainability on that one. So gotcha. I, I try and try and stay with oils where I know sustainably that they're okay. Um, I mean, that's the other advantage you've got with a lot of your Australian oils is in terms of sustainability, you don't really have, I know there's an issue with sandalwood, but you don't really have the issues that, that other countries sometimes are experiencing, um, which again might then sort of add to their popularity over time because we're looking for things that, you know, are filling those gaps. I think spiritually, I think we're definitely looking for oils that, that do that. And like you say, there's maybe there's something respiratory going on as well because of the fact that we all live in close, again, depending on where you live in the world, but certainly in the UK, we're all living in quite close proximity. You know, there's yes. a lot of, um, you know, and now people seem to have forgotten all about COVID-19 and everybody's sort of in each other's space again. And, you know, which is great in one respect, but in another, you know, suddenly people sort of start getting sick again. So just ordinary coughs and colds, you know, because we've been so sort of protected for a long time and now we're, we're just kind of sharing that. So I think we... You know, we live close together in the UK. We we travel close together. You know, you get on a tube or a train and it's stuffy and it's, you know, we, we're not good at it, to be honest. So I think sometimes the respiratory oils are very good at kind of Mother Nature's way of going, let's just all back off from each other a little bit. Let's be part of something wider, but let's just back off a little bit and give each other a bit of breathing space, literally. Um, but yeah, I think the South American ones, I think, yeah, again, I think it's a spiritual element. I think it, you know, they're, they're coming with a different um, I'm fascinated by what you say Adam I'm going to go and look that up now I'm going to go down that rabbit hole for the afternoon <laughs> there you go you, it's a big rabbit hole to go down right now we love to look, look at okay let's look at chakras what chakra would you designate this to Liz heart uh, yep I, I'm going to disagree with you I actually really love this one from the third eye chakra I talked a little bit about that feeling safe to go into that intuition and and bring that magical side in and and almost um safe to think for yourself is is a message i kind of get from kundra as well so i i actually like it with the third eye chakra do you work much with chakras helen i don't i don't i'm afraid so i tend to i tend to listen to what other people that do say about them and kind of go oh that's interesting <laughs> but um i i can see it from both sides actually yeah i think with anything respiratory i always want it to kind of go here for me um, yep yeah yeah so that, yeah um, that's my feeling about it. when i said heart it feels it's definitely sits there to me yeah yeah and um astrologically liz I don't know is the answer to that and, and yes 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 I do yes I do so I don't think it falls under a western constellation I'm going to say Alpha Centauri which is in the Southern Cross because that is about protection Got you. Yeah, very different. Well, I'm not going to choose a planet either. I'm going to choose an asteroid. Um, I actually like it with Lilith. Now, Lilith, sometimes you hear about these calculated points and dark moons, but there is actually a rock in the sky. My memory serves me right. Is it 1181? I think it might be. But Lilith is, um, you know, she's that epitome of that energy of Lilith, the first wife of Adam who didn't obey. She went out there. She said to be the first discoverer of astrology because she worked out how the world worked and all these different things. She she danced to the beat of her own drum. And I find that Kunzia kind of opens, as we said before, opens up the gate and allows us to do that. So finding out where Lilith is in your birth chart can be really quite revealing of you know where you can kind of break free and be an individual. So have, have a dance in that. And yeah, so we're both steered a little bit odd with Kunzia, but it's a special world, it deserves special treatment. Yeah, I, I, the more and more I work with Australian oils, I think it's kind of important to always try and address that it can't always be the white man's constellation. 
<laughs> of mm. it because you know it, 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 there so if you can kind of just kind of shift your awareness and say well does it feel like that one does it feel like that one that's a healthy way of kind of examining and, and trying to undo this like cultural misappropriation that we've done with everything yeah now a bit of time for shameless self-promotion i'm going to start off this week no, nothing too major but we, me and liz are brewing on something we're going to actually have if you're loving these um you know listening or watching these we're going to give you the opportunity to join us live to ask your questions and we're going to go even a little bit deeper in the oils so watch us on our social media whether you're subscribed to my newsletter or whether you're on um Liz's great pages on facebook or instagram we're gonna and we'll let you know on this um episode as well coming up we've we're we're, bre we're, we're brewing up something in the cauldron right now aren't we liz we are i'm quite excited by it to to allow people to ask questions about the oils that we've done and to to because we can write comments on the bottom but you don't kind of get to the heart of what you want to ask do you sometimes so to work live with people is going to be quite exciting i think what about you liz what would you like to push this week or promote so well so actually i'm going to uh push mine and helen's workshop tomorrow we've talked about it quite a lot but so it's nice for people to get to know helen a bit but so helen and i both have rather strange ways of dealing with essential as well got a lot of strange ways of dealing with a lot of different things in life, haven't i but um so i hear essential oils as musical notes and helen sees them as colors we never asked what color we um she saw it was so we should ask we should ask that but when you're looking at sort of um, shamanistic work, quite often you can be using different herbs and what have you to go on journeys. And a common thing that happens with those is these um, sort of barriers between different senses fall down. And so it's almost as if we have like this united sensorium. So Helen and I thought it'd be quite interesting to get people sort of cross sensory uh, appreciating them just to see if, you know, to enjoy things on a different le uh, level and to get a deeper feeling about it. Thoughts help? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, um, yeah, definitely uh, green. Sorry, going back to Kunzia. Oh, green. 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 green is the colour with Kunzia. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so our workshop tomorrow is very much talking about thinking about um, exploring things in a cross sensory way. So not approaching essential oil with one dimension, but looking at it from a a, a multi sensory pathway really um which is kind of what we do as synesthetes anyway um it's just expanding that so that actually when you do come across a new oil or you find something new and you want to address that or look at that you know it's a different way of kind of approaching it really mm. and I, now, I think oh sorry one of the things no, that, one of the things that I found kind of difficult about marketing this workshop is people go, well, why? What, what's the point? And I, I read something in a tremendous book the other day by a guy called Daniel Shulker, who is, is like an occult herbalist. And he answered the question directly. And I thought it was so clever. And he said, whose mastery are you looking to improve? And it's not necessarily about your client. It's about your deeper understanding and your your better command of using the oils to understand it from lots of different ways, um, not just from the chemistry. Sorry, Ad, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, you know, to promote your, your workshop, I think it's really important for anyone, whether they're a practitioner or whether just they love essential oils for their own personal use. You know, we've said it before, you and I are not the experts. What we say is not correct. We're facilitating our experiences and the information we have, but we want you to stand on our shoulders. And so, you know, was Helen right? Is it green? Is it celestial dark blue as I see it? Or is it pink? It, it's up to each individual to kind of dive in and to, to get their own understanding, their own relationship with it. So I think this workshop would be a really great way to help people get their own mastery. I think so. I think so. Okay. Hel, what would you like to promote? Oh, I'm just going to flag up my book in my shameless promotion. Here you go. <laughs> it's called Working with Unusual Oils. So it's on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. So it's available worldwide. That's great. So we'll, we'll obviously put a, um, write Helen's name and stuff for you in the description so that you can find her nice and easily. 
the reason I'm so impressed with you, Helen, and, and your book is I don't know how you could write a book and not fit 6,000 oils in there because they would probably, ha, who made the cut? How did you decide? Where did you go? I need to stop now. Oh, Dave, it's it's awful. And, you know, when you asked me that question about which ones are going in your second book, and I'm like, oh, well, I'm not sure because it keeps changing. And these are definitely staying in, but I'm not sure. Um, and it, oh, it's terrible, terrible decision making on, on the second one. I was like, oh, how, how many do I put in? Where do I go? It's really hard, isn't it? It's really hard knowing when to stop. I mean, I find that difficult with anything. When do you stop researching something? When do you stop writing about something? When do you stop, you know? It's me. When you stop talking about an oil, you know, it kind of it can go on and on and on, can't it? Um, if you love something, it's difficult to know when to stop, isn't it? But um, it, yeah, I kind of it was it was easy with the first book because uh, I'd been teaching on some of those oils, so they kind of you know it it felt like I'd explored them quite recently. Um, it's really hard to know when to stop. I think I did pull some out of the last minute out the second book because which isn't out yet because of the sustainability issue, because I did, thought I don't want to encourage people to use stuff that they, you know, stuff that's already struggling. You know, there's enough plant material out there for us to go to essential oil bearing plants that aren't struggling. We don't want to encourage anything more. So then some I'd started to write about, I just had to take back out again. And that's, that's kind of it really. Yeah. I think at some point you just kind of have to know when to stop, don't you? <laughs> Yes, exactly. And, <laughs> and then there's a, a third edition and a fourth edition and a fifth edition. Absolutely. And then eventually you kind of you do something else and <laughs> it all goes full yeah. circle eventually, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. So Liz, I think we've got one last thing to do. We've got to decide what we're going to talk about next week. Yeah, it's my turn to pick, I think, isn't it? I think it is. So I want to do a tree oil like we were talking about this alpha opinion i'm interested in doing scott's pine how's your thoughts on scott's pine it's one i haven't worked with much at all so i've got to yes, get my study finally on. i've got the upper hand <laughs> good good well, <laughs> can you get scott's it easily pine over is. there actually because obviously scotch means scotland but but can you get it easily I I have I think I have a little bit of my collection, so yes, I should be that. That should be fine. Yep. Good. Cool. Um, <laughs> I, I've got I've got some things to say. I must admit, you know, with, with the oils I work with, I love my conifers, and pine is probably the one that I I work with the least. But I it's starting to yell louder and louder, and so yeah, next week I'm very excited to talk about that one. Good, Helen, good. thank you so much for joining us. As we said before, Helen's details will be down below where you find out. So please. Um, check Helen out. Do yourself a favour. Get Helen's book. It's absolutely amazing. I love it. So I can't and speak favourably enough of it. If you do want to book onto the workshop, it's on my link team. So, so please do come and play with us tomorrow. Helen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having Thanks, me. Hill. We'll see you next week when we explore, or explore even, Scott's Pine on Fellowship in Essential Oils. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.